Hey friends, we're back for part three, beginning on page 213. The section begins meiosis, the cellular basis of sexual reproduction. Okay, ready? Here we go. Now that we've spent some time discussing asexual reproduction and chromosome number, it is time to move on to sexual reproduction. There are many facets of sexual reproduction, but we will concentrate on the cellular level because it forms the basis of what happens during all of the other stages of sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction begins with meiosis. Meiosis, the process by which a diploid 2N cell forms gametes in. Now this definition might seem a little mystifying, especially because you do not know what a gamete is. That's okay. This definition will become clear to you as you continue to read. You learned way back in module number one that in sexual reproduction, the offspring are not identical to the parents. Instead, the offspring might have some characteristics in common with the parents, but other characteristics that are quite different from the parents. This happens because in sexual reproduction, each parent contributes DNA to the offspring. As a result, the offspring has DNA from both parents. If a human has 46 chromosomes and each parent contributes to the DNA of the offspring, then it should make sense that each parent can contribute only 23 chromosomes. If the parents each contributed more than 23 chromosomes, the offspring would have more than 46 chromosomes. For reproduction then, the DNA of the parents must get whittled down to 23 chromosomes. How does this happen? Well, that's what the process of meiosis is all about. In meiosis, diploid cells get split into haploid cells called gametes. Gametes. Haploid cells in produced by diploid cells, 2N, for the purpose of sexual reproduction. In animals, the gamete produced by the mother is called an egg or ovum, while the gamete produced by the father is called the sperm cell. A human gamete produced by meiosis then will have only one of each chromosome pair. This makes 23 chromosomes. When a gamete from one parent joins up with a gamete from the other parent, the two sets of 23 chromosomes merge to form a diploid cell that has 23 homologous pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. One member of each homologous pair will come from the father and the other member of each homologous pair will come from the mother. When gametes join together, the resulting diploid cell is called a zygote. We actually presented the definition of a zygote back in module number four, but now at least you know how a zygote forms. So before sexual reproduction can begin, Diploid cells must form gametes. This is accomplished through the process of meiosis, which is actually similar to mitosis in several ways. In fact, the phases of meiosis have the same names as the phases of mitosis. The details of these phases, however, are a bit different. In addition, meiosis one I'm sorry. In addition, meiosis involves a few more steps. In fact, 
the process of meiosis is split into two groups of phases, meiosis I and meiosis II. Each of these parts of meiosis involves prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. In order to begin meiosis, a cell must duplicate its DNA, just as it must for mitosis. The centrioles must duplicate as well. At that point, the cell is ready for the first stage of meiosis, prophase one. During this phase, the centrioles move to opposite sides of the cell, just as in mitosis. Also, the mitotic spindle begins to form, just as is the case in mitosis. By the time the cell has reached the next phase, metaphase one, the spindle has formed and the microtubules are attached to the centromeres so that there is a single microtubule for each set of sister chromatids. This is different from what happens in the metaphase of mitosis because in mitosis, one microtubule attaches to a chromosome and another microtubule from the other centriole attaches to the chromosome's duplicate. Thus, in mitosis, the microtubules attach so as to pull the chromosomes away from their duplicates. In meiosis, however, the microtubules attach so as to pull the homologous pairs apart while leaving the chromosomes attached to their duplicates. In anaphase one, then, the homologous pairs are separated, being pulled towards the centrioles on the opposite sides of the cell. Now, think about how this is different from mitosis. In the anaphase of mitosis, each chromosome is separated from its duplicate. Thus, the X shape goes away because the chromosome goes one way and its duplicate goes the other. Both chromosome homologa, homo, sorry, both, <laughs> sorry guys, both chromosome hom homologs go one way while both duplicate homologs go the other. I don't know what is wrong with my mouth. Let me try that again. Both chromosome homolo homologs, it's homologs guys, homologs. Both chromosome homologs go one way while both duplicate homologs go the other. In anaphase one of meiosis, however, the chromosomes stay with their duplicates. Instead, the homologs are separated from one another, breaking up the homologous pairs. In telophase one, the plasma membrane constricts along the equatorial plane, forming two cells. These cells are haploid because the hom homologs have been separated. However, each chromosome still has its duplicate attached to it at the centromere. Thus, each of these cells need to split those duplicates. Well, if you think about it, these haploid cells are ready for mitosis because they have their chromosomes duplicated with the duplicates attached to the originals. Thus, each of the two haploid cells goes through a process very similar to mitosis, which is called meiosis II. In meiosis II, both cells enter prophase II by having the centrioles duplicate and once again travel to the opposite ends of the cell, forming a spindle. In metaphase II, the spindle is fully formed the chromosomes are lined up along the equatorial plane and the microtubules attach to each chromosome and its duplicate at the centromere. In anaphase two, the microtubules of the spindle pull the chromosomes away from their duplicates, 
with the originals being moved toward one centriole and the duplicates moving towards another. Finally, in telophase two, the plasma membrane in each cell constricts along the equatorial plane, forming two pairs of cells where there were originally just two cells. The four cells are formed then, and they are still haploid because no homologous pairs are present. In addition, there are no chromosome duplicates in any of the cells. The process of meiosis is summarized in the figure below. So if we compare mitosis and meiosis, we can see several differences. Mitosis takes one cell and makes an exact duplicate, resulting in two cells. If the original cell is diploid, the copy will be diploid as well. In contrast, meiosis takes a single cell and produces four cells. The cells produced are quite different from the original. The original is diploid, but the four cells produced are haploid. These haploid cells are called gametes. In addition, meiosis has twice as many steps as mitosis. Finally, while the anaphase of mitosis keeps the homologous pairs of chromosomes together, and separates the chromosomes from their duplicates, anaphase one of meiosis separates the homologous pairs, keeping the chromosomes and their duplicates together. While studying cellular rep reproduction, there's one very important thing to remember. Two sister chromatids that form the X shape during mitosis and meiosis count as only one chromosome. Thus, if you look at figure 7.9, the two cells at the end of meiosis one have two chromosomes each. Both of those chromosomes are duplicated, but the chromosome and its duplicate count as only one chromosome because they each carry exactly the same information. Since the duplicate adds no new information to the nuclear DNA, it does not count as a second chromosome. Before we leave this section on meiosis, it is important for you to understand that although meiosis occurs in both the female and the male of an animal species, there are differences between the two. As we mentioned before, in males, the gametes produced by meiosis are called sperm, while in females, the gametes are called eggs. It turns out that these gametes are quite different. As a result, the process of meiosis too is different in males and females. In male animals, once telophase two ends, the gametes produced grow flagella. This is accomplished by a centriole, which moves to the plasma membrane and grows a microtubule through the membrane and out into the surroundings. The sperm can then use these flagella to move about in search of an egg. A schematic of male meiosis is shown below. In female animals, something quite different happens. At the end of telophase one, one of the two cells that are produced takes most of the cytoplasm, as well as most of the organelles. Thus, this cell is much bigger than the other. Both cells go through meiosis too. However, since the small cell is so small, the two gametes it produces are quite small. In addition, when the big cell reaches telophase two, one of the two gametes, gametes 
once again takes most of the cytoplasm and organelles. As a result, meiosis II ends up producing three tiny gametes and one large gamete. The three tiny gametes, often called polar bodies, are useless. If they are fertilized, the resulting zygote will quickly degenerate and die. Only the large gamete, called the egg, can produce a viable zygote through fertilization. Since the functional egg produced by female meiosis has been formed by taking most of the cytoplasm and organelles during both meiosis I and meiosis II, it should make sense to you that the egg cell in a female is much bigger than the sperm cell in a male. In addition, since the sperm cells have a means of locomotion and the egg cell does not, the egg cell must sit still and wait for the sperm cell to travel to it. These facts are illustrated in the figure below. Once the egg and sperm meet, the sperm burrows into the egg and the haploid cells fuse to form a diploid cell. This diploid cell, called a zygote, can then begin to develop and grow. To do this, the zygote must begin producing many cells, which it does by mitosis. Viruses. In module number two and number three, we spent considerable time discussing bacteria and protozoa that cause disease. Despite all of that discussion, however, we have not mentioned another common agent of disease, the virus. We decided to put off such a discussion until now. This is because viruses cause disease by overriding certain cellular processes, such as reproduction. As a result, it seems only natural that a discussion of viruses should occur in the module that discusses cellular reproduction. The definition of a virus is rather specific. Virus, a non-cellular infectious agent that has two characteristics. One, it has genetic material, RNA or DNA, inside a protective protein coat. Two, it cannot reproduce on its own. Based on this definition then, a virus is not alive. Since it cannot reproduce itself, it fails to meet one of life's basic criteria. Well, if a virus is not alive, what is it? The best way to answer this question is to show you a couple of viruses. Now, don't let appearances deceive you here. Even though the bacteriophage looks like it has legs, the tail fibers, a body, the sheath, and the head, the protein coat, it is not a living organism. It is a highly organized mixture of chemicals, mostly proteins and nucleotides, that can perform some pretty specific tasks, nothing more. Notice from the figure that while the genetic material in the bacteriophage is DNA, the genetic material in the HIV is RNA. This is the case with viruses. Some have RNA as their genetic material and others have DNA. The main thing you need to know about viruses is the way in which they infect their hosts. Since viruses cannot reproduce themselves, they rely on cells to do it for them. In order to do this, 
a virus will attach itself to a cell. The virus either enters the cell or injects its genetic material into the cell. The genetic material of the virus redirects the cell's reproductive machinery to reproduce the DNA or RNA of the virus, as well as the proteins that make up the virus. The cell's biosynthetic machinery is then directed to assemble these pieces into new viruses. This continues until there are so many viruses that the cell ruptures, destroying the cell and releasing new viruses to infect other cells. This process is called lytic pathway. Although figure 7.14 or 7.14 is drawn for the specific case of a bacteriophage infecting a bacterium, all viruses reproduce and infect via the lytic pathway. Some viruses, however, can inject their genetic material into a cell so that it lies dormant for as long as several years before beginning the, the lytic pathway. Thus, the time between a host receiving the virus and manifesting the symptoms of the malady caused by the virus can be several years. This is the case with HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Viruses cause many diseases and afflictions. Warts, chicken pox, the common cold, influenza, some forms of cancer, mumps, measles, AIDS, and many other diseases are caused by viruses. Of course, viruses affect other organisms as well as humans. Plants can be killed by viral infections. As illustrated in figure 7.14, even bacteria are subject to viruses. In most organisms, there are infection-fighting agents that can destroy viruses and other pathogens. People, for example, have a host of infection-fighting mechanisms in their bodies in module number six, you learn that the process of, of a cell engulfing a chemical or another cell is called phagocytosis. Well, there are certain cells that use this process to destroy pathogens, including viruses. These cells are called, reasonably enough, phagocytic cells. Some white blood cells, for example, are phagocytic cells. They often circulate in the bloodstream, but when an infection strikes, they can leave the bloodstream and go to the point of infection in order to engulf the pathogen. Some phagocytic cells do not need to move, however. They reside in the lymph nodes of your body. Special cells called lymph carry, excuse me, some special vessels called lymph vessels carry fluids through the lymph nodes. And pathogens that are in that fluid get engulfed by the phagocytic cells that are there. People have several defenses against pathogens. One very interesting defense is the ability to produce antibodies that ward off pathogens. Antibodies, specialized proteins that aid in destroying infectious agents. While some antibodies can help destroy a host of different pathogens, other antibodies are highly specific and can only aid in the destruction of one type of pathogen. When your body is infected by a pathogen, 
specialized cells work to produce antibodies that will help to destroy that pathogen. Once the cells are successful at producing such an antibody, other cells are produced that actually remember how to produce that antibody. If you happen to get infected by the same pathogen again, or one very similar to it, those cells will immediately help to produce the antibody that they know is successful against that pathogen. This increases the speed at which your body can fight off the pathogen, making you less likely to be overwhelmed by the pathogen. This makes it less likely that you will get sick from the infection. This is the principle behind vaccines the most common way that medical science can fight viruses. Vaccine, a weakened or inactive version of a pathogen that stimulates the body's production of antibodies, which can aid in destroying the pathogen. When a person is infected by many viruses, the only way to rid the person of the virus is for the body to make a specific antibody that will aid in destroying it. The body can produce antibodies against many, many different viruses. However, some viruses are so fast acting that the body cannot produce antibodies before many viruses have completed the lytic pathway. By that time, the body is overwhelmed by the virus. As a result, the disease kills or permanently injures the person. When you are given a vaccine, a weakened or inactive version of the virus is injected into your body. This virus has been changed so that it cannot enter the lytic pathway very effectively. As a result, your body has plenty of time to figure out what antibodies to make in order to destroy it. Once your body produces the antibodies, it produces cells that remember how to do it. That way, when you are exposed to the real virus of the same type, those cells help the body produce the antibodies specific to the virus right away. This reduces the number of viruses that can enter the lytic pathway, making you less likely to get the disease that the virus causes. So, in essence, a vaccine works by giving you a virus. <laughs> of course, since this altered form of the virus cannot enter the lytic pathway very easily, it is not as harmful as the real virus. However, your body doesn't know that. So it manufactures the antibodies to destroy the virus, thus protecting you if you later come into contact with the real thing. This is why vaccines must be given before you get infected by the virus. Once you get infected, your body begins producing antibodies. At that point, then, a vaccine will do you no good. Thus, vaccines act like a wall of defense. If you do not build the wall before the attackers come, you will be too late. One thing to note is that some vaccines don't even contain a virus at all. For some viruses, medical scientists have been able to construct a chemical mimic that the body thinks is a virus. This kind of vaccine is ideal, of course, because it doesn't contain a pathogen at all. There is a movement afoot these days that says vaccines are bad for you. Some members of this movement say that vaccines aren't even effective at preventing disease. Others say that vaccines are effective at preventing disease, but they have side effects that are not worth the protection that the vaccines give you. However, 
both of these ideas are just plain wrong. There are many ways to demonstrate that vaccines are very effective at preventing disease. Consider, for example, the two graphs below. They show the rates of polio and measles versus the year for which the rates were measured. Notice that in the case of polio, the disease rate rose in a shaky but steady fashion from 1944 to 1952. Then there was a slight 34% decrease in the disease rate from 1953 to 1955. However, from 1955 to 1957, there was a dramatic decrease, 80% in the disease rate. What explains these drops in disease rate? Well, notice that the first polio vaccine was licensed in 1955. The dramatic decrease in disease rate then came right after the polio vaccine was used on the general public. What about the smaller decrease from 1953 to 1955? Well, the vaccine was developed in 1952 and tested shortly thereafter. For example, in 1954, it was tested in a double blind study of 1.8 million children. The slight drop in disease rates prior to 1955 then was most likely due to the testing of the polio vaccine. Now, look at the graph for measles. Once again, the story is similar. There is not nearly as much of a rise in the measles rate in the early years, 1944 to 1958. However, once again, there is slight decrease in the disease rate just prior to the licensing of the vaccine during the testing phase, and then a dramatic decrease in the disease rate after the vaccine began being used on the general public. These data dramatically illustrate the effectiveness of vaccines in preventing disease. The safety of vaccines is also well established. Before a vaccine is approved for use in the United States, it must go through many tests on animals. And then it must go through three separate phases of testing on people. In each phase, the people that volunteer for the test are closely monitored for health problems. If the rate of health problems in the testing group is higher than that of those not getting the vaccine, the vaccine is not allowed to be used on the general public. By the end of this three-phase testing process, the vaccine has been tested on thousands of volunteers over a period of several years. If the vaccine were not safe for the vast majority of people, this three-phase testing system would demonstrate, would demonstrate that, and the vaccine would not be approved for general use. That's not the end of the story, however. Even after the vaccine is approved for general use, its effectiveness and safety are continually monitored by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. If a problem is found that is possibly associated with the vaccine, detailed studies are done to see if the vaccine does indeed cause the problem. If so, it is no longer allowed for general use. The stringent testing methods used on vaccines along with the constant monitoring done on them, lead the American Academy of Pediatrics to state, quote, vaccines are one of the safest forms of medicine ever developed, end quote. Samuel L. Katz, representing the American Academy of Pediatrics in testimony before the Committee on Government Reform, U.S. House of Representatives, August 3rd, 1999. Now, if you think about it, 
The concept of a vaccine is, in fact, a testament to God's power and majesty. After thousands of years of medical science, people cannot fight viruses as efficiently as God's creation, the human body does. Thus, to protect ourselves, we simply stimulate the body to do what God designed it to do in the first place. The vaccine gives the body a little push and the body does the rest. If you would like to know more about vaccines, please visit the course website discussed in the student notes section at the beginning of this book. That website contains a link to a detailed discussion of the safety and efficacy of vaccines. Well, friends, that ends our reading of module number seven. Again, Happy New Year. Stay well and stay safe. God bless you. See you next time for module number eight.